Good evening, hushlings, and welcome. I present your preceptors to the underbelly of the void, the whispers of conjecture, and the known of the unknown. Thus begins the conclave of the Hush Hush Society. Hello again, hushlings. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And as always, we're joined by our chilly willy, Slick Frank Sanders. Ah, Slick Frank Sanders here. What is up, my dudes? How are you doing tonight? Beautiful. Another week, another debriefing, another Hush Hush Society get-together. Yes. It always makes my day. Warms the cockles. It melts the ice. <laughs> Welcome back to the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. If you guys tuned in last time, we covered the Titanic. We talked all about the White Star Line and the famous ship that sank in the North Atlantic. We discussed how the Titanic could have possibly been switcherooed with the Olympic, another ship of the White Star Line. We also got into how a fire in the coal bunker of the ship possibly could have weakened the hull. It was a pretty valid theory. Not to mention the potential of a mummy's curse that could have possibly sank the Titanic. It was a pretty fun debriefing. Hope you guys tuned in. It was. My favorite part of that was the Aurora Borealis <laughs> sending <laughs> someone into a hypnotic state where they just <laughs> yeah. veered to the right. <laughs> that was the best part. Ah, maybe that's what happened. I don't know. Who's to say? <laughs> Some swamp gas off the, uh, the from the light of the moon, just the reflection, and blinded the <laughs> ship. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> it was a swamp gas in the middle of the North Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the MIB would tell you. Yep, yep. This week for debriefing 19, guys, 19 <laughs> debriefings, and some change if you've listened to all our other stuff. This week, we find ourselves at the South Pole. We're still touching ice, I guess. We, we love ice the past month. It's a chilly season. Yeah. 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 It's, it's cold out here. deep. And <laughs> this week, we are talking about Antarctic bases. Real, real deep, deep and cold. Real cold. <laughs> real deep real and cold. cold. But before we head south for the winter, we just want to remind you to hit us up on all social medias. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find all the audio for this episode and every other episode up on our YouTube. Just search for Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. We also want you to check out a brand new, just released in case you haven't heard, Hush Hush Society merch store. You can find it at hushhushsociety.bigcartel.com and exclusively for our hushlings, we have a 20% off your order coupon. Just go in and at checkout, enter hushling20, all one word. Another reminder, March 29th, Fast Approaches. It is our live show. We will be discussing the Denver airport and a secret society. We'll also be doing giveaways. We'll also be doing trivia. We'll also just be there with our knickers on. It's going to be a great time. Make sure to join us on our Facebook page when we go live, 6 p.m. March 29th, 6 p.m. Eastern. Our 20th wonderful episode. 20, boys. It's going to be a lot of fun. It is. Before we dig into some conspiracies, let's mention a few things about this landmass. Antarctica is the southernmost continent. It contains the geographic south and almost entirely south of the Antarctic Circle, and is surrounded by the Southern Ocean. It's 5,500,000 square miles, and is the fifth largest continent, about twice the size of Australia. It is the least densely populated continent, and about 98% of Antarctica is covered by ice that averages around one mile thick. The ice extends to all but the northernmost areas of the Antarctic Peninsula. On average, it's the coldest, driest, and windiest continent, and has the highest average elevation of all the continents. Most of Antarctica is a polar desert with annual precipitation of 7.9 inches, yet 80% of the world's freshwater reserves are stored there, which is enough water to raise global sea levels by about 60 meters or 200 feet. 
The temperature in Antarctica has reached a negative 135.8 degrees, as measured from a satellite. Can you imagine that? No. That's absolutely insane. I feel like that's enough to freeze your skin so much that it just kind of flakes off within like half an hour. That's just that's just what I picture. You gotta be able to just like break body parts off. I think about your eyeballs. Mm. Oh, just drying just out. think about your eyeballs. It's drying. Do you out. think they would dry Frozen. out or freeze first? I think yeah. they would freeze. Does anybody know the freezing point of a human eye? <laughs> <laughs> Think about the YouTube videos that are out there where somebody goes out and they say, oh, it's cold. It's really cold out. And then they throw up water in the air and it instantly turns to like mist or like a snow. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that happening to the moisture on your eyeballs. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Do you think that it'd be so cold that you wouldn't be able to blink or that your eyeballs would freeze first? You know how when it gets really cold, it's kind of like hard to move your fingers and stuff like that. Like if you're really cold, do you think you'd even be able to blink at that point? I'm sorry. I got a little sidetracked, but pretty much what we're getting at is this is the most terrible continent to try to settle in. There are pretty much no settlements. It's unlivable. So you're saying there's no water parks. I'm sure there might be a Cocoa Keys or something like that. (laughs) A A little continental history. Organisms native to Antarctica include many types of algae, bacteria, fungi, and certain animals, such as mites, nematodes, penguins, seals, and tardigrades, or known as microanimals, also known as moss piglets. That's my favorite part <laughs> about, about the entire thing. And where there is vegetation, it is tundra. Antarctica is noted as the last region on Earth in recorded history to be discovered, unseen until 1820 when a Russian expedition sighted the Fimble Ice Shelf. The continent remained largely neglected for the rest of the 19th century because of its hostile environment and lack of accessible resources. Like we said, bottom of the planet, awful place to be. The Piri Reis map is a world map compiled in 1513 by the Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Reis. Approximately one third of the map survives. It shows the western coasts of Europe and North Africa and the coast of Brazil with reasonable accuracy. Some Atlantic islands including the Azores and the Canary Islands are depicted, as is the mythical island of Antilla and possibly Japan. So this is especially intriguing since we just mentioned the continent was first discovered in 1820. Getting back to the history of the continent real quick, Antarctica is an ancient land that has undergone some incredible transformations over millions of years. Before it became a frozen desert after the Ice Age, Antarctica was actually a warm region with rainforests and possibly even civilizations. The theory came from the discovery of fossilized wood, signs of tropical trees, leaf impressions that show the existence of rainforest in Antarctica's past. Scientists have also found fossils of marine animals, birds, and dinosaurs from the Cretaceous period. Among the smaller species, they've uncovered the fossilized forewings of a beetle species that lived between 14 and 20 million years ago in a warmer climate, and tiny single-celled fossils. This is one of the most intriguing things about Antarctica that could tie it to having ancient civilizations, whether it's subterranean or it's something that's left there from the past. Because Mm. if it was only found in 1820, and this was, what, 1513? This map, I've seen pictures of it, too. You can can look it up. When I heard about this, the pictures they're showing, it's clearly Antarctica on a map. If it was first discovered by humans in 1820, but 300 years earlier, people were poking around there and they knew about it. There's definitely a lot of mystery going on with this continent. That's interesting, the the development of the continent itself. I know that throughout the centuries, the continents themselves move as the plates of the planet, they shift around. Now, do you think this transformation has undergone in Antarctica due to it possibly moving around or just the axis of our planet slowly sort of shifting? Like Pangea. 
multiple different ancient continents. Could it have been a slow burn, like what most geology says in geologic terms, or could it have been a subterranean cataclysmic event like crust displacement theory? Like Frank said, that's kind of where my mind went, took a little left turn there, and thought back to Pangaea. And Pangaea was like the supercontinent that existed on the Earth hundreds of millions of years ago when there was pretty much just one continent. And then through shifting of plates, that's how we have continents now. So I'm with Frank with the thought that maybe this piece of land used to belong to something bigger and then eventually drifted away into a southern hemisphere where it got massively cold. I think that also explains a lot of what's going on with the tropical trees and all the things that they found under the ice. Yeah, that that was kind of my my train of thought. Of course, we got to bring in the uh, the politics of the world, even in the most remote oh. continents. Fucking everything, dude. Let's talk about the Antarctic Treaty. It's something that we've discussed before. Antarctica status is regulated by the 1959 Antarctic Treaty. Antarctica is defined as all land and ice shelves south of 60 degrees south for the purposes of the treaty system. The treaty was signed by 12 countries, including the Soviet Union and later Russia, the United Kingdom, Argentina, Chile, Australia, and the United States. The Antarctic Treaty prohibits any military activity in Antarctica including the establishment of military bases and fortifications, military maneuvers, and weapon testings. Military personnel or equipment are permitted only for scientific research or other peaceful purposes. That's kind of vague. Scientific research? Can it be malicious? Yeah. And since the, the 1950s, so... What kind of scientific research are they doing in Antarctica for the past, what are we at, uh, 60 years? Holes in the ground. Holes. I knew they do like ice core samplings and stuff like that, and they check out what the landscape looked like from different eras based on those ice core samplings. But part of me feels like over the past 60 years, maybe, just maybe... There's got to be more to that. It can't just be, yeah, we've been doing this since 1959, where we come here, we get a core sample, and we look at the core sample over and over and over again for 60 years. I was listening to a, a pretty crazy TED talk about the scientist that was conducting research. He was the head of a research team in Antarctica, and they were pulling marine life out of this underwater lake, a lake under the ice, I should say. And mind you, the ice was maybe a mile and a half to two miles thick, and the shit they were pulling out of this lake, it looked insane, alien almost. And the craziest part about it to me was that despite the thick crust of ice over this lake, the water temperature was something like almost 30 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, obviously supporting life. Yeah. Isn't that a geothermic encapsulation or something? It's something where, where the heat of the center of the earth starts to heat the waters underneath the surface. Yeah, there's all those weird little underwater geyser things. It is very odd. If you've ever seen any kind of pictures of, like you said, any kind of marine life or multi-cell organisms that they found in Antarctica, a lot of them, like you said, are very crazy looking. They do look very much like they're not from this planet. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Imagine being trapped under ice for millions of years. I think some of those lakes, because there's lakes and river systems under the ice from the existing continent, because I'm pretty sure whatever research they've done where you can actually see the landmass with the ice removed, it's actually two separate massive islands. Really? With lake in the center and river systems. Can you imagine that type of shift from it being a normal climate to what it is today? only took days or weeks. Whatever organisms that were in those lakes from millions of years ago could still be trapped, trapped and adapt. And it's going to be completely alien because nothing on this planet has seen anything like that in millions of years. But it's been there. What else is there? The main tree was opened for signature on December 1st, 1959 and officially entered into force June 23rd, 1961. The original signatories were the 12 countries active in Antarctica during the years 1957-1958. The 12 countries that had significant interests in Antarctica at the time were Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Chile, France, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, South Africa, the Soviet Union, 
the United Kingdom, and the United States. But that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I was wondering to myself, why did only 12 countries sign this treaty? That makes a lot of sense. It's just the ones that had major interests in the continent. It's also countries, a lot of these countries that have some of the most, I'm not sure about South Africa, but it's definitely <laughs> some of the main superpowers of the world. Yeah. Belgium has a, a military. Australia has a military. Chile, I'm sure because of proximity, and Argentina because of proximity to the continent. And on top of the way that their military works, and you have France and Japan and Russia and the U United States and the UK. I mean, those are massive military powers so that's the suspect part it's the major countries that have either really really good science or really really good military power yep well let's jump into operation high jump it's officially titled the united states navy and arctic developments program developed from 1946 to 1947 as a united states navy operation organized by rear admiral richard e Byrd jr who we've spoken about in length previous times before. Its objectives, according to the U.S. Navy report of the operation, training personnel and testing equipment in frigid conditions, consolidating and extending the United States' sovereignty over the largest area of the Antarctic continent, publicly denied as a goal even before the expedition ended. Determining the feasibility of establishing, maintaining, and utilizing bases in the Antarctic and investigating possible base sites. Developing techniques for establishing, maintaining, and utilizing air bases on ice with particular attention to later applicability of such techniques to operations in interior Greenland where conditions are comparable to those in the Antarctic as well as amplifying existing stores of knowledge of electromagnetic, geological, geographic, hydrographic, meteorological conditions in the area. And lastly, supplementary objectives of the Nanook Expedition, which was a smaller equivalent conducted off eastern Greenland. So they were all over the poles, man. They were up, down, left, right. In and out. It sounds mostly like they wanted it to just do military testing in cold areas, which I, I guess kind of made sense in the 40s and 50s when they start looking at the Soviet Union with the Cold War kind of starting. It's possible maybe they wanted this land just to see what it was like for our soldiers to fight in Russia. Yeah, for sure. And if the soldiers could endure the Antarctic, they'd be fine in Russia. The biggest thing is knowledge of electromagnetic and geological things and meteorological. They want to know things that go on there, obviously, because it's a really alien climate and it's really inhospitable. But And electromagnetism obviously goes hand in hand with the poles with the Aurora Borealis sinking the Titanic and all that uh, other yes. shit. <laughs> but that's really interesting. They wanted to know everything. And the geological part makes me believe that obviously, like I said, they want to know things that are going on, but they want to know what's going on under the ice and why. If you really break down their goals in regards to Operation High Jump, you start to see that maybe it's a little more than what they are putting down on paper. There's a little more behind what they're trying to say or what they're trying to do over there. But let's talk about Admiral Byrd, our good friend Richard Byrd, who we spoke about in our previous episode of The Hollow Earth, debriefing number 16. He was an American naval officer and explorer. He was in the First and Second World Wars and took place in operations like Operation High Jump and Operation Deep Freeze. In that episode, we actually talked about Bird's Secret Journal from 1947, which included a report of flying into the Sims Hole and making contact with a race that lives inside the Earth. Ah, uh, yes. Dick E. Bird's Man Diary. <laughs> Dickie Bird. <laughs> Admiral Dickie Bird. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't be. Admiral Richard E. Bird allegedly wrote his encounter with a lost civilization in Antarctica. According to Hollow Earth theorists, Bird met an ancient race underground in the South Pole. An interview appeared in the Wednesday, March 5th, 1947 edition of the Chilean newspaper El Mercurio and read in part as follows. Admiral Richard E. Byrd warned today that the United States should adopt measures of protection against the possibility of an invasion of the country by hostile planes coming from the polar regions. 
The Admiral explained that he was not trying to scare anyone, but the cruel reality is that in case of a new war, the United States could be attacked by planes flying over one or both poles. End quote. Like we talked before with Admiral Byrd, he had explained that he went to a subterranean world, and it's pretty intriguing. It's been intriguing since we looked this up weeks ago. I think its first mention was when we did the Men in Black episode, when we first started talking so. about the Daros yep. and the underground civilizations that exist. And then it further went into detail when we started talking about Admiral Byrd and the Hollow Earth theory. And he mentions a place called Agartha. And Agartha is a legendary kingdom that is said to be located in the Earth's core. There was Nazi presence in Arctic territory, both north and south. It's well documented that the Nazis explored Arctic regions to set up bases and test novel weaponry. But it's also well documented that Hitler and the Nazis were obsessed with esotericism and the occult. And Hitler could have escaped to this underground world. Or Brazil. Same thing. <laughs> Or Argentina. Nazi maps, believed to be instructions for reaching Agartha, have supposedly been corroborated by a letter from a German U-boat navigator named Carl Unger, who claims U-209 made it to Agartha, and that the Earth is in fact hollow. Damn, another guy. Why didn't we find this guy? Damn, Unger. Because he was too busy sinking the Titanic. That's right. Uh, yo, Carl Unger, the man who put an end to the boat. <laughs> Damn it, Carl. Oh, man. We always circle back to the Germans because they were involved <laughs> in so many, supposedly, involved in so many different conspiracy theories, so many different paranormal things, occult things, as we said, esoteric happenings. The Nazis and the Germans in general were so much involved in so many different things that it's hard not to mention them. And I know it's kind of a recurring theme for us. I guess you could even say that the Germans stuck their evil fingers in the Sims hole. <laughs> <laughs> Hushlings will return after this short message. Hushlings, I'm Declassified Dave. I'm Slick Frog Sanders. And I'm Mystery Mike. Welcome back. We are live again as we explore the art-covered walls, odd sculptures, and alleged miles and miles of underground tunnels of the Denver International Airport. Rumored to have a secret joint military and extraterrestrial base below its busy terminals. We also explore the magical secret society of Golden Dawn. We recap season two and introduce Hush Hush Trivia. Tune in and you could be a lucky hushling that will receive brand new Hush Hush apparel and giveaways like sticker packs join the hush hush society conspiracy hour march 29th for our second live show on facebook for debriefing 20 the denver airport and golden dawn What's up, Hushlings? Declassified Dave here. We're teaming up with a fellow Hush Hush Society member and friend, California Macaroons, a small business located in San Diego, California. Baking classic French macaroons. Every batch is made with organic, local ingredients. Everything is handmade from scratch, and the list of flavors is getting longer every day. Now offering nationwide shipping within the U.S. Check them out and place an order today at CaliforniaMacaroons.com. Together, we're dishing up something sweet and exciting. Be on the lookout for Mystery Macaroons, exclusively baked for the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. Welcome back to the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. Anyways, let's get more into the Germans and their, uh, their fascination with Antarctica. The first German expedition to Antarctica was the Goss Expedition from 1901 to 1903 led by Arctic veteran and geology professor Eric von Drygalski. This was also the first expedition to use a hot air balloon in Antarctica. Mm. But yeah, that's some shit out of a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Float into the center of the earth. I just feel, yeah, that is that's the like most Mary impractical way to go about it, I feel <laughs> like. I don't know. Hans, lower us into the hole. <laughs> <laughs> it takes like 19 hours. <laughs> it's got to be so awkward. There's like nothing to do. Just a bunch of Germans piled into a little hot air balloon basket. 
the second German Antarctic expedition from 1911 to 1912. Titanic. <laughs> was led by Wilhelm Filchner with a goal of crossing Antarctica to learn if it was one piece of land. And along with other such early attempts, the crossing across Antarctica failed. You fucking So think? there was no hot air balloon. And plain English, yeah. no hot air balloon. Can you imagine going there like the coats they had in 1901 and 1903 and being like, this is <laughs> fine, we'll be warm. They were wearing their weird, long, leather trench coats and nothing else. <laughs> Did they have sled dogs and stuff? Oh, I'm sure. Those poor German shepherds. The third German Antarctic expedition from 1938 to 1939 was led by Alfred Richer, a captain in the German Navy. The main purpose was to find an area in Antarctica for a German whaling station as a way to increase Germany's production of fat. As whale oil was the most important raw material for the production of margarine and soap in Germany. Another goal was to scout possible locations for a German naval base. That's insane. So I have two fun <laughs> facts for you guys. 95% of German whaling was done from hot air balloons. No, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and have you seen all of those SS officers with their German hair all slicked back and shit? Yeah, that's whale fat. Ooh. They used whale fat to slick their Imagine. hair back. But let's get back to uh, hauling a whale across the sky with a hot air balloon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really wanted to know what type of hot air balloon they're using. It's like a Dr. Seuss hot air balloon. <laughs> it's got all these cranks and gizmos. Wilhelm, <laughs> did you ever see the film Free Willy? We are, oh we are bringing back an orca to the fatherland. Turn the flame up high. We want to see this whale soar. Soar like the golden eagle above Germany. All right, we're way off the rails. Hitler, as we said, did have a passion for the occult, and he was searching for something in Antarctica. The Nazis built a station in Antarctica, however, it is claimed to be abandoned. It's also theorized that the Nazis used underground Antarctica as a secret hideaway, and some people believe that Hitler fled there after the war. Could you imagine if that's what happened to Hitler? Eva Braun gets taken out, the dog gets taken out, Hitler escapes in some little German jeep, a Volkswagen, I'm guessing, gets on a U-boat, goes to Antarctica, gets out of the U-boat, and goes, this is it. This is where I'm spending <laughs> the rest of my days. Nobody's going to find me here. <sighs> Let's talk about New Swabia. Yes, you heard that right. Let's get in it. New Swabia was a disputed Antarctic claim by Nazi Germany within the Norwegian territorial claim of Queen Maud Land. New Swabia was explored by Germany in early 1939 and named after that expedition ship, Schwabenland. Itself named after the German region of Swabia. So they claimed a spot. They took it from Norway. They claimed a territory within Norwegian territory. But this is well before the treaty, though. That's the thing. And they named it after the ship that was named after the German region. Yes. So Swabia. they were so they were planning on on definitely creating something down there. They had an expansion in mind, for sure. It's kind of a random thought, and maybe it's a little outside the box, but whatever. It makes me think: What is the distance from Antarctica to New Swabia? The thought behind that is: is maybe let's say that there are underground tunnels or cavern systems that are in Antarctica. How far do they reach? See, that was an outside-the-box thought, but you just tied it together. I see what you're saying. So, like, Fr Frank was talking about uh, how he had heard about these lakes that are one to two miles underneath the ice. One to two miles underneath the ice isn't really that far, but think not so much depth, but more distance. So, is it possible you go one to two miles underneath the ice, you're down a certain depth underneath the actual ocean? And you're able to travel within a cavern system. Maybe that could bring it all back to how we had said in Hollow Earth, how the Earth wasn't necessarily entirely hollow, but there were mass cavern systems. And that there were parts of the Earth that could possibly just have voids underneath them. I don't think that's very far-fetched at all. It, it was just a thought that popped into my head because Antarctica is huge. And... It definitely has cavern systems. The Germans figured that out. They set up underground bases. That's confirmed. So how far did those cavern systems go? 
Did they get down below the ice level? And did you actually reach quote unquote land? Bedrock. Maybe that was the whole idea of taking over just this random piece of Arctic land from Norway. It shows on a map that Queen Maud land looks like a quite large area. It's a decent sized chunk. I would say that they got at least the equivalent of half of Brazil, it looks like. It's a very coastal spot. I guess you'd have to look geologically what could be in that area that could cause them to be poking around. I'm sure if they are still there, it's completely subterranean. The Queen Maud land piece of land itself is massive. It's not like it's a small piece yeah. of land. It's 2.7 million square kilometers. Oh, 1.4 wow. million square miles. It's a big area. If you look at pictures of Queen Maud land, it's a lot of rock. It's mountain. It's not all snow. There's big, massive land masses that come out of the snow. We had said before, if that is land mass... And that, and it kind of looks like mountains, it is made of stone. Is it possible that there is some sort of cavern system underneath? It's a lot more easily accessible to get to than trying to dig through a mile of ice, for sure. And we all know that the Nazis were good at hiding bases. They have many all over Europe that were just in plain sight. Mm. Whether they're underground or built into the side of things. We even have stuff like that here in the United States. Yeah. Not far-fetched to think that they have all of that and Hitler's body's in a, a mechanical and he's in a jar like Futurama, you know, <laughs> still down there chilling, shitty mustache and all. All right, boys, let's get into the real shit here. The holy grail. This part of it is, I would say, the most exciting for me and it draws to a lot of different conspiracies worldwide, pretty much. The pyramids, not of Egypt, of Antarctica. In 2016, a striking screenshot from Google Earth showed a set of near-perfect pyramids, partially covered by snow, with countless theorists contemplating its origin. Some are wondering whether an ancient civilization created the rocky pyramidal structure, and others are pointing towards outer space, speculating the involvement of aliens. You can view the image online, and from above it actually does oddly resemble the pyramid system in Giza. Very much looks like Orion's Belt, just like at Giza and other pyramid areas all over the world. Geologists say it's just a mountain that coincidentally resembles a pyramid. Yet others, like ancient astronaut theorists, suggest otherwise. I think they could be pyramids. We say that we, we see pyramids on Mars and this and that, but I think they possibly could be pyramids. If this is a continent that was in a warmer period and it suddenly became cold, yeah, who's to say they're not wind eroded? And I would say the, the winds are probably stronger in the South Pole than they are on the Giza Plateau, and they're probably far older. They definitely could be pyramids. I don't want to shoot it down immediately because there's pyramids scattered miscellaneously all over the planet. And like you said, possibly even on Mars. But on the other hand, Google Earth images can be a little misleading and dicey sometimes, as I'm sure you guys know. Like I said, I don't want to instantly discredit it, but there's, there's also that to keep in mind. There's definitely pictures of it, too, from the ground level. I am always weary now, especially nowadays, of geologists and of different people that are supposed to be leaders in their field, especially when it comes to ancient civilizations. Graham Hancock. We always talk about Graham Hancock. He's the talking head when it comes to stuff like this. But like Frank said, if you look around the world, there are pyramids strewn here and there. Egypt is not the only place that had pyramids. They weren't the only civilization that had them. I don't find it too far-fetched to look back over the millennia, look back to the continent before it was covered in ice and snow, and think that there possibly could have been a civilization there. So if there was a civilization there, maybe they, much like the other civilizations that built pyramids, also built a pyramid. For geologists to come out and say, that's just visually what it looks like. It's not really what it is. I don't trust that. These are the same people that are coming back and they're saying that, not geologists especially, but they're in the same range of people that come back and say, well, humans have only been around for 12,000 years. And, and we definitely know that's bullshit. But they hold on to their old ways. Graham Hancock will say that a thousand times, how all these scientists and these geologists and archaeologists, they hold on to their old ways and their old thoughts because that's what they were taught. And to teach them anything new that goes against 
against what they know as true, quote unquote, kind of shakes the foundation of what they know. When these people come out and they say, it's just visually, that's what it looks like. That's not really what it is. I call bullshit. That's what the human eye does. Exactly. Not only that, but I feel like a lot of these geologists, scientists, whoever you're talking about, even if they think otherwise, even if they think that's more than just a mountain, there's a possibility that it's a pyramid. They won't come out and say it for the most part because they're scared about how it's going to affect their public image in their Mm -hmm. field and their credibility as a professional in their field, which isn't how science should be, which isn't how anything along those lines should be. You should be able to speak your opinion and your thoughts and be able to research it and so on. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing to take away from it is like what Mike said. There's the stuff that you learn academically, and then there's the other people that have academic studies under their belt, but they're thinking outside the box. A little mm-hmm. bit more and they're asking questions off of stuff that they've seen and like we said we mentioned graham hancock he does things in they call it a pseudoscience but archaeoastronomy where he takes things like pyramids and structures that human beings have made in the past and correlates them to celestial movements and people in a lot of the academic fields like mike said they're taught that and something new it can't be possible it makes it really difficult for us as an entire civilization on this planet to expand when you have all these doors and stone walls that you're hitting, they entirely could be pyramids or they could look like pyramids and they're just mountains. So I'm real jazzed about this also. And it was something that we previously mentioned. So it's said that the lost city of Atlantis is hidden beneath many feet of ice. According to Charles Hapgood's 1958 book, Earth Shifting Crust, the continent of Antarctica was in fact originally much further north than its current position. Due to the shifting of the Earth's crust, the continent was displaced and the climate of the continent, which had been mild, plummeted into a below freezing climate. This shift in location and temperature has led some to argue that an ancient civilization existed on the continent, which was subsequently destroyed by this monumental geographical realignment. Can you imagine being alive for that, though? Uh, no. It's like watching that one scene in, what was the movie, 2012. Venice Beach is sinking into the water because everything's displacing. Because they talk about this and that. That's the exact cause of, I believe, that movie is crustal displacement theory. Does it happen that fast, though? I think that's the theory. Is but that, imagine if it did. Yeah, that's the theory that we don't know. Things on geological terms are super slow to human beings, but a million years geologically is fast. Can you imagine if you had something like that was in the movie that's an actual Earth process that happens, whether the magnetic field shifts in a weird way or some part of the asthenosphere moves around deep inside the Earth or you have a massive earthquake or there's the people that live in Agartha bombing us from below. (laughs) If that happened drastically... We're all fucked. That also probably would only affect the area in which the land separated. Let's say even something ridiculous, like 50 miles in each direction just broke, fell off into the ocean or into the center of the earth or whatever. You still have a massive piece of land that people possibly could have been living on. If you're looking strictly at Antarctica, a massive piece of land, 100 miles of your land was just taken out and now the continent has separated, how fast is that continent moving? It's probably not moving even miles per hour. (laughs) But if it was, Mike, but if it was... I can't even imagine if you were just on a piece of land and then all of a sudden you were jet-setting at like 90 miles an hour on a piece of land (laughs) the size of Antarctica. But here's the thing, right? If you were, maybe not 90 miles an hour, but say the chunk of land was moving at a steady... 10, even 20 miles an hour. Would you really know? <laughs> Hell yeah, you would know. Would you know? I think he... I don't yeah, know. I don't know? I don't know if you would. Because think about it. The Earth is spinning incredibly fast right now, and we have absolutely no sense of that. That's true. And mind you, the clouds move, and you're stationary. If you were standing on a chunk of land, and you didn't know that you were moving, and the, the sky's moving by, and maybe it just feels super windy, would you if know? If you were on Antarctica, and all of a sudden, Antarctica was pulling away as fast as a ship from a dock, and you're waving to all your family and friends, see you later, <laughs> and the whole fucking piece of land is moving at 25 miles an hour, I think you would know. Maybe not the people yeah. that are at the center of that land mass. That's probably possible that they wouldn't know but uh, well, I don't they'll know. find out pretty quick when it freezes up 
what if that's what happened with Easter Island? What if that's why there's no trees? They used them all to build boats to get back to their lost homies. I think they actually proved that there was two warring tribes. They completely wiped out their resources on the island. That's why there's no trees. Like, they actually, like, this is a tangent, but I think it was because there was one tribe that was on there, and they actually split apart into two, and they were maybe not necessarily warring with each other, but they ended up just depleting all the wood resources on the island. In ufology, conspiracy theory, science fiction, there's claims of stories linking UFOs to Nazi Germany. The German UFO theories describe supposedly successful attempts to develop advanced aircraft or spacecraft prior to and during World War II, and further assert the post-war survival of these craft in secret underground bases in Antarctica, South America, or even the United States, along with their creators. Could it possibly be tied to Area 51? I did hear about that. It's possible that when it came down to UFOs or ships that look like UFOs that the Nazis in Germany had been developing, that they did eventually move to Antarctic bases. Maybe let's... All right, so Admiral Byrd was in what year? 1947. 1947. So stick with me here. It's going to get a little wild. Okay. Imagine, if you will, post-World War II, there are Germans that escape after the war, Nazis, whatever you want to call them. They escape after the war. They take these ultra top secret UFO looking spaceships or airplanes from Germany, fly them to Antarctica to their underground Antarctic base where the Nazis continue to exist. Who knows what, what happens to them in the coming years? But that happens in 19, what, 44, 45, around when, when the World War II ends. 1947, Admiral Byrd is flying a plane, goes into a Sims hole, or what he perceives to be a Sims hole, goes inside, sees a, quote, civilization and flying saucers. When in reality, Admiral Byrd, in his own lost and confused and fancied thoughts, maybe flies into an underground airport, quote unquote, into a German base that is based in Antarctica. And what he thinks he sees as a hollow earth civilization is actually a Nazi base. And what he thinks he sees as UFOs are actually German UFOs. Yeah. I hate to say it, but I feel like that's more believable than the original Richard Bird story. All right. So in his account, he never says that he speaks to them, right? He just says that he flew into it. Or was it John Cleve Sims? Was it John Cleve Sims? That yeah, it was John Sims. Said that he had contact? Yes. Admiral Bird had just flown into a Sims hole. And his boss was like, you better not say anything or else okay even further if you really want to talk conspiracy i will get fucking deep bird flies into the sims hole what he thinks is the sims hole it's actually the opening to a, to a, an airport or an airstrip that is underneath the ice that the germans now occupy okay he sees this civilization quote unquote it's actually the nazis he sees the ships it's actually nazi ships that they've been hiding there okay and developing he goes back he talks to his superiors his superiors turn around and they go hey shut up let's not forget what america did with nazi scientists post world war yep. ii yes so Let's say World War II ends, America takes these scientists, we say, okay, what have you guys got going on? Well, you're not going to believe Boom, this, space program. but if you go to Antarctica, we have a bunch of ships that we've been building and a bunch of shit that we've been working on. We can build them here or you can go and use them down there, whatever you want. It is said so many times that Nazis continue to exist. They continued to exist, they planted themselves in America, they planted themselves throughout the world, and they still pulled the strings on certain things from behind the curtain. Can I put a little cherry on the ice cream right here real Oh, quick? please do. I don't think we've mentioned that a large portion of the research expeditions that have taken place in Antarctica, specifically with American scientists, have been mostly funded by NASA. Mm-hmm. You mean the Nazi Aerospace Administration? <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, if you really want to put your tinfoil hat on today. Yeah, I, I guess if you want to, <laughs> if you want to go shoot to the moon on that, then uh, wouldn't you think that a group like the Nazis who had insane wealth because they pillaged and mm -hmm. stole the riches of the world? Wouldn't you think that they would have more funding than little old NASA, which 
doesn't get funding from the U.S. government. Doesn't get funding from the U.S. government. Where do they get their funding from? Private. Well, I mean, they stopped getting funded from the, yeah, private, private, private. so what's private? So what is private? Who is NASA's number one scientist that they've ever had? Mm. A Nazi. A Vonner. Von Braun. Uh, he helped create NASA, right? Wasn't he, wasn't he one of the founders of NASA, right? I could be wrong. They came yeah. over and taught us rocket technology. That's all I'm saying. Yes. And there were plenty of visual evidence to suggest that Nazis had developed ships or planes or whatever you want to call them that look like UFOs. There's the encounter of the bell in Pennsylvania, I believe. Mm -hmm. I forget what year that was in, but there was a swastika on it. There you go. This is an actual confirmed craft that Nazi Germany was working on. Yeah. We've always said, extrapolate from the data. You look at the facts. If you bring in all the different things that we've looked at from all our past debriefings, from things related to Admiral Byrd, related to Hollow Earth, related to now the Antarctic bases, Nazis, how many times we've gone over them, just put the pieces together. It's intriguing. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary tinfoil hats. That's fucking right. I wear a fucking tinfoil helmet. It's pretty dope. All right, left turn, left turn, left turn. Ready? We're not going to get crazy deep about it because we have some things planned on the subject. We're trying to keep it pretty low profile. Season three. We got a lot of things for about this on our plate. I <laughs> get it. We can't get into the subject of the Antarctic without mentioning flat earth and the ice walls. Now, modern flat earth beliefs originated with the English writer Samuel Robotham. Based on the conclusions derived from the Bedford level experiment, Robotham published a pamphlet titled Zetetic Astronomy. He later turned it into the book Earth, Not a Globe, proposing the Earth is a flat disk centered at the North Pole and bounded along its southern edge by a wall of ice. Antarctica. He also claimed that the sun and moon were 3,000 miles above Earth and not the known 93 million miles we know today, and that the quote cosmos was only 3,100 miles above the Earth. Space is not real. Holodome, 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 holodome. I don't want to get too deep into it, like you said, but. Not too deep. Yeah, not too deep, but the only weight that I can see anybody saying, well, we don't know what's beyond the ice walls. Well, that's because there's 12 fucking countries that tell us that we can't go to Antarctica. We don't know what's in the center of Antarctica, but for people who subscribe to Flat Earth Theory, it's the portion of the dinner plate that keeps your minestrone soup in your dish. <laughs> it's interesting, and I cannot wait to not do this one and do this one. <laughs> It'll be great. It's going to be really fun. I can't but, wait for all the shit we're going to catch. Yeah. Oh, and I'm going to put on the biggest baseball mitt I can to catch that <laughs> shit. It all boils down to Antarctica and what's going on down there. If we can't get down there and get into its interior as the general public and there's no flights that go over it. Obviously, there's no flights over it. The place fucking sucks. There's no, yeah, there's no need to fly over it. We'll get into it. From elongated skulls, strange pyramids... Alien spaceships, many people believe that Antarctica once housed extraterrestrial life and ancient civilizations, like we said, Nazi bases, and the ends of the Earth have many more mysteries and theories, like we said, flat Earth walls. Mike, what do you think is under the ice? If you want to go over my latest theory, <laughs> uh, <laughs> now that I've said it out loud, it kind of makes sense that Nazis were there. As far as right now, I do think that there is a vast cavern system underneath Antarctica. I do think that it is not simply just a bunch of ice and snow. There is more to it. I don't think that you would have a research team there for upwards of 60 years just looking at ice core samples. I'll put it this way. There is more than is being told to us, and I will leave it at that. Frank. Frank's final thought. To sum it up, I agree with Mike. Antarctica is really just this, the base template for many conspiracies around the planet as a whole, whether it be flat earth, hollow earth, the continent in itself is a whole entire conspiracy theory. I definitely think that at some point 
the Nazis could have bunkered down in some of these cavern systems. The fact that these cavern systems exist is real. It's been proven. There's lakes and rivers existing underneath these shelves of ice. There's definitely more to be discovered with Antarctica, like Mike said. I think Richard Bird might have been mistaken. I don't necessarily know that he saw an alien civilization. I think it was more likely, like Mike said, if anything, a small Nazi civilization. But I feel like he would have seen like swastikas everywhere because they were all about that. That is true. Atlantis, I don't think it's Antarctica. Frank's final thought. That's it. I'm on the fence. It could just be a really desolate, cold continent that we went to. But also, I really, really subscribe what you're saying. It's entirely possible that all the claims and how much technology the Nazis had, even if they didn't use cavern systems under Antarctica, it's entirely possible for them to have constructed, I'm sure, something. It's a strange thing, especially with Admiral Byrd that he flew into a hole and is this hole close to an ice wall or was it in fact like he said the center of a globe or our planet as we say it is sum it up i really believe that the nazis probably hunkered down there if they are still there it's probably super advanced and it could entirely prove the existence of a lot of these spacecraft that we see that might not actually be spacecraft well hushlings that is going to do it for debriefing 19. What are your thoughts? Did we miss anything? Do you have other thoughts on what could possibly be going on in Antarctica? Reach out to us. Find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also email us any topics you want to hear. If you want to discuss this one or any other topic, please email us at Hush Hush Society at planetmail.com. You can also go over to our YouTube and hit the subscribe button where you can listen to our episodes. And you can also listen to a YouTube exclusive Declassified Discussions where Declassified Dave interviews you hushlings about your paranormal, odd, scary stories and don't forget to go to our merch shop we just put up so many t-shirts hoodies uh coffee cups we're gonna have masks soon uh we can send out stickers if you want some stickers we have those also once again that website is hush hush society dot big cartel dot com Hushlings, don't forget to tune into our live show March 29th, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be covering the Denver airport alongside a secret society. We'll be doing some trivia, doing some giveaways, answering your questions. Come hang out. It'll be a good time. And Hushlings, don't forget about Cryptid Chronicles, because we have not forgotten about Cryptid Chronicles. We have one to two more coming out this season and plenty more in the future planned. Stay tuned for our next Cryptid Chronicles episode with a special guest. Thank you, Hushlings, for joining us as we plugged the Sims hole yet again and went under the ice. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And I'm Slick Frank Sanders. Hats and booties, hats and booties, hats and booties. Until our next debriefing, remember, the best kept secrets are hidden in plain sight.